There was a man who was sitting on the banks of the powerful and turbulent Hudson River. And it was a particularly cold day. And he had his head in his hands and he was contemplating his life, which had been anything but turbulent. In fact, it had been spectacular. As a child, he was gifted with mathematics and he ended up attending Yale, joining the Skull and Bones Society and pursued an economics PhD where he pushed the boundaries of economics and he was deemed to be brilliant. And he became a notorious economist through a series of events which I will describe. He was contemplating what had happened in the last 10 years of his life, specifically how the world had changed so dramatically that it didn't look anything like it did in the prior 10 years. How, for instance, the automobile industry who was offering custom-made cars, now these incredible beauties, the Rolls Royces and the Duesenbergs, which didn't exist before. And how buildings had been erected that were so tall that they seemed to defy gravity and would change the skylines forever. And how women who'd been pressuring the governments for tens of years now had the vote. They could participate in the political process. And how movies which had been silent now had sound which made a huge difference. In fact, The Jazz Singer is the very first movie to have sound released in, in New York. And how Walt Disney had introduced Mickey and Minnie Mouse, characters that would thrill millions of children, and how some sculptors had found this enormous rock in Mount Rushmore and decided to build the bus of these famous American presidents. And in fact, the stock market itself, in the space of nine years, had gone up 10 times in value. And the world was seeing an excess never seen before. And his name was Irving Fisher. He was a brilliant economist, conservative man, put together and real. 30 miles away, there was a very different man. He was born into a farming family and at four learned to read and write. And at 14, his father pulled him out of school to run the farm. But he was much more ambitious than that. And so he moved to Boston, where he ended up taking a job at Payne Weather as what's called a board boy. A board boy is the person that sits in front and writes up the stock prices for people to trade. He was making $5 a week, and he was thrilled with this. He would see the faces of the people coming in who would be trading shares. And he learned to read them, and he became an expert trader. And at 15, he made a trade where he made more than one week of his salary. So he decided to do it for himself. And he became very good at that. And he made a lot of money, and he lost a lot of money, and he was a very colorful character. And his name was Jesse Livermore. And then one day, the two of these guys met. And when they met, it set off a series of events that would fundamentally sunset the way the world was working today. It resulted in a cataclysmic event 
that would change everything. October 14, 1929, a trader on the New York Stock Exchange proclaimed that Union Pacific Railroad stock was overpriced. And there was a little run on the stock and panic ensued in the market. And that resulted in a massive sell-off, which wiped out 11% of the value of the market then. But Irving Fisher pronounced the next day that this was a normal correction. This is what you would expect with this type of economic action. And the markets recovered on the next day. But then the weekend came and news of what had happened the previous week began to travel. In those days, communication took time. And on the Monday, there was panic. And in the panic, there was another major sell-off. And this time, it was 14% of the value of the market. And then on Tuesday, it evaporated. And I think most of you know what happened after this, but through these progressive trading days, the market lost 89% of its value. Think about 10% of the value of the market remained. And it spiraled the world into a recession and a depression that was so large, it would take 24 years for the markets to come back. 1954, the markets recovered to the same point in time. And half the US financial institutions went out of business, 11,000 banks, 15 million people, which is 30% of the working population, 50% of production was wiped out. It was a terrible time. And then the two men met again a few months later. And Irving Fisher was looking perplexed at Jesse Livermore. Irving Fisher was now bankrupt. This brilliant economist who understood everything was now bankrupt. Not only had he put his own money in the market, but he'd borrowed an enormous sum too. But meanwhile, Jesse Livermore, the guy who came from nowhere, experienced something extraordinary. And his story is not really very well known. He, in the days leading up to the market, shorted the Dow Jones Index because he saw the traders on the floor, the looks in their faces, and he realized most of these people coming into the bucket shops to do this trading were borrowing money from banks. And he didn't think it was sustainable. And so he thought it was a bubble. So he shorted the market, and he made one and a half billion dollars in today's currency. Not a lot of people know that. We just hear about the recession. And when I heard this story, I was really taken aback by the concept of the story. And the concept is, as we go through life, there are defining moments that present themselves to us, lots of them. And the question becomes, are we ready for them? Are we along for the ride, beholden to the outcome that will be provided to us, like Irving Fisher? Or are we ready to maximize our outcome? Are we prepared? Have we thought it through? And I was thinking about Aptus, and I was thinking about you, our customers, and specifically the quote to cash process, which of course is what we do. And I began to realize that this process, which arguably is the most important process in any company, it's the revenue process, is riddled with defining moments. There's all sorts of things that take place that if we don't manage to them, we'll have a very bad outcome on our enterprises. But there's one above all that if we don't manage properly, can have a catastrophic impact to our enterprise. And that is the moment we present a price to a customer. 
The moment we present a price to a customer, everything is being defined. The revenue of our company, growth, profitability, even the CEO's job. Because if we don't manage that point in time, the entire financial viability of your organization is affected. So you would think, given how important this process is, we can call it a quoting process, that we all have it nailed, right? You would think that in this defining moment, we are on top of it. Now, I've worked with many, many of you, and we're in the marketplace a lot, and boy, it is shockingly far from that. There's all sorts of challenges in the quoting process for many good reasons, but we do have to get it right. If we don't get that right, we materially affect the outcome. So we go into the marketplace, we find a solution, hopefully Aptus, we implement it, and now we're feeling good. We've nailed it. We know when we put the price, it's optimized for the company. But wait, if you're a business selling to a business, which is most of us, then 72% of the time, you're selling to an existing customer. And if you're selling to an existing customer, then you need to know what did they buy, the products, services, assets, what's the pricing structure, what discounts, what do we have in place? That information is typically in a contract. So just a quoting tool is insufficient to truly maximize this defining moment. So we go to market, and we look at contract management tools, and we pick one, hopefully Aptus, and we implement it, and now we're feeling very good. And we can put a billing tool in there too. We feel good. We now think we've maximized it until we start getting some customers who say to us, wait, I don't want a salesperson selling to me. I want to buy from your website. Or I buy through a distribution channel, a multi-distribution channel. And so now we need to make sure that as the price gets presented to that group of customer, that we have an e-commerce capability. We have an ability to make sure that we're maximizing that price presentment too. And so we look at the e-commerce world, and I think we all un understand where that is right now. And so we go in market, we pick an e-commerce tool, hopefully Aptus, and now we've automated the quote to cash business process. So now we're feeling really good. We've done everything, we've automated the process, we have speed, we have visibility, we have control over our quote to cash. But here's a sad reality. Just automating a business process doesn't necessarily result in the outcome you want. And the example I use is one of putting a quoting tool in place to dissuade a sales guy to offer a discount. We put a threshold that, that if you want a higher discount, they need an approval. The goal is to dissuade the sales person to do it so that you're controlling your pricing better. Well, we all know most times the sellers will just go and hit that button and say, bring it, get in the way of my revenue. And so actually the outcome doesn't necessarily change. We haven't maximized the outcome. We've automated the process and we're in a better state, but we haven't maximized the outcome. So the question is, how do we change the behavior of the user? Not just performing the functionality, but change the behavior of the user. And for a salesperson, that one can be pretty obvious. Commissions. So could you imagine at the point in time where they're about to hit the button for that discount and a commission calculator comes up and says, wait, if you do that, you're going to make less. Or if you don't, you're going to make more. More than likely, you will affect the outcome. More than likely, you will be in a better place. So the behavior layer apps, which Aptus has been pioneering around quote to cash, we believe are extremely important to get your outcome. It's not just about automating the process. And there are some other apps, promotions of behavior-related apps to get your customers to do other things, and rebate, rebate management in certain industries like healthcare, life sciences, CPG. These are incentive structures too to drive the behavior. So now we're feeling good. We have process management. We have, we have things in place to make sure the behavior is happening the way we want. But we add another component. And that is, invariably, 
in doing something in our organizations, somebody's probably done it before and probably better. Similar type of customer, similar type of contract, similar type of quote. So why can't we take that insight and present it to the user? And that's what we've been doing for, for about two years, machine learning, AI, where we go into the data, we find an insight that's context relevant to that user and present it to them. So this is the quote to cash footprint. And to us, this is staggeringly obvious. And yet no one in the marketplace is doing this. No one. We're the only provider with outcomes-based management, end-to-end -end functional footprint. There are many players in each of the individual boxes, but nobody offers the whole thing. And we believe very strongly in this. We even wrote a book about this last year. This is how you get your outcome. It doesn't mean we have to do all of it now, or maybe some of it you'll never do, but it gives you the runway to get your outcome. And the market has noticed, specifically the IT analyst groups who we've been working with for the last 11 years. We founded the company 11 years ago. And they did look at us perplexed, understanding how an overall footprint is different to the constituents. But in the last year, we've had extraordinary success with them. They have flattered us by making us a leader in this first quadrant, the CPQ quadrant. We are the global leader. I can tell you from humble roots as the founder of this company, to see that years later is an absolute honor. But it's not only that. In contract management in the last 12 months, we've been the global gold standard, but we're also ranked the leader in contract management. And then if you look at the rest of our spaces, we're either designated a leader or an up and comer that's right behind the leaders because our strategy is very innovative and different. And I just want to say, they are sitting in this audience, so if we could please give them all a round to sincerely thank them for supporting Aptus through our journey. <laughs> the second constituent that has really recognized us in the last year has been the media and press too. And we've had great relationships over the years, but in the last 12 months, we've caught the attention of the most esteemed media institutions, CNBC, Fortune, Forbes, TechCrunch. You can see them up there. And that's been incredible for us too. And I will say they have supported us extraordinarily. They are also sitting in this audience. So I'd like to thank them too for being on the journey with us, please. And then the final constituent is the most important constituent, and that is you. When we as founders sit back and look at that customer list, and this is a very small subset, it's unbelievable to us to be honored for you to go on your paths and journeys, and they're not always easy, has been incredible. And you're with us. And it's amazing. It allows us to put an event on like this and to share our best practices. It's been incredible. And so I just want to say on behalf of the founders, Kent and Neha up here earlier, my employees and my investors, that it's been incredible. And we want to thank you very sincerely. Please give a hand for all of you. Thank you. One of the advantages of being located in Silicon Valley is we're surrounded by a lot of innovation, new thinking, business models, and technology. And we love that. We love trying to see what is it out there that can help progress our front. And in our case, it's not technology for the sake of it. It's not the cool next thing. It's how can we take that and drive a customer outcome? So our mindset when we see a technology is, can we use it in some way to progress your outcome rather than the next cool thing? And we've been doing that. And the first one I walked through the footprint is truly comprehensive functionality. Nobody else is doing that. That in itself is innovative. 
and has resulted in great gain for many of you. And of course, we talked about the new era of AI, cognitive computing, and how it, we believe, will fundamentally change all sorts of things. And in the revenue process, and the quote to cash process, that could be very, very significant. And then the last component is the concept of user experience. And I'll come back to an element of that in a minute, but the user experience at the end of the day is equally as important as functionality because if we don't have our sellers or whoever using a tool, then you don't get your outcome. So these three things have to come together. And what we've been doing is taking these technologies and creating our own cloud. And we've created the Aptus Intelligent Cloud, which is a fusing of all these different technology components. And this is the new era. When you look at a lot of SaaS companies now, they are moving to hybrid structures. And the reason for this is, as we all know, whatever technology we use, there's a limitation. And the question becomes, do we just offer that technology and push the limitation onto you, our customers? Or do we look at other technologies where we can have a microservice architecture or some other service to make it better for you? Do we live with the constraints of a technology stack? Or do we enhance it to give you a better experience? Very, very important part of our strategy, especially for the larger customers, which are most of ours. And so that's what we've done. Most of you know our roots are with Salesforce. Salesforce is an incredible platform. We help them pioneer the whole concept of native solutions. And we have an amazing relationship with Salesforce. I hear rumors of people saying, are we leaving the platform? We are not. We have a long-term relationship with Salesforce. We have a long-term contract. We are their largest private investment. They use us for quoting and contract management internally. They're a very important part of our strategy. But there's a series of other things, other technologies, other market opportunities for us that by pulling them together, we can offer a better deal to you, a better value proposition, a better higher order outcome. And so we've started very significant relationships with Microsoft and IBM, looking at all of their very interesting technologies that can play a very large role in getting a better outcome for you. And I wanted to highlight one of them, and that's centered around user experience. And this is how we thought through this. If we look at enterprise application user experience today, it is very 20th century. We expect a seller or a contract manager to open a laptop, log into a system, hit home page, hit opportunity, update. And it's very physical, it's very hands-on, and it's retro. That information came from earlier in the day, yesterday, or maybe a month ago. And that's how we've constructed it. You look at all of enterprise apps, we're, we can have this amazing functionality, but we're asking people to take time to go through a very clunky, unintuitive way of managing to an application. And if you look at the world today, it is this. It is social, it is mobile, it is virtual, but it's particularly conversational. And so the question is, how do we move from the left to the right? How do we navigate all of this functionality in a way that's intuitive, easy, and get people loving the application? And I think most of you have seen this. I know there's a lot of posters around our event, but we created this virtual assistant that does exactly that. So Max is a virtual assistant through a conversational interface that will do a whole bunch of things for you. So using Skype for business, texting, email, directly off your phone, even voice activated, you can have a conversation with Max and she'll execute something. There's a whole series of different things she can execute and this is amazing technology. No logins, no physical, no retro time. And I put some examples up here that show the type of things that can be done with Max. Requesting a quote, managing an approval, 
changing a price. There's all of these low-hanging fruits. We can also do very sophisticated God. things. Max, what are you doing here? I know our customers are there. Do you think they're interested in me? Max, I've only just talked about you, but I'll tell you what, can, can you lift your hands to see if you're actually interested in learning more about Max? Great. Kirk, how many people are interested? Max, just take a look. You can see the hands up in the air. Very funny. You know I can't see, but I can share information about my capabilities. Would you like me to? Absolutely, please. Please get on with it. Great. I've just sent a message through the mobile app to everyone in the audience. I think Don't you should you all have that. Don't you be interested in seeing what else I can do? Uh, I do, but we were planning a demo a little bit later on. But, you know, given you've interrupted me, why don't we just go ahead and do the demo now? So I'll tell you what, I think most of you have met Nick McCoy, my demo man. Uh, he's usually up here with me every year. So let me invite Nick McCoy to the stage. Nick, let's give Nick a hand. <laughs> I have a feeling Nick was ready. Nick, you ready? Kirk, dude, we weren't supposed to start yet. I thought I had more time. Nick, you told me you're always ready. All right, um, guys, yeah, we're good. Okay, fine, let's just get started. You know what? We don't have a computer. We're not on stage, but that probably shouldn't matter. Because like Kirk just said, right, Max is an intelligent agent. Doesn't matter where you are, as long as you have a phone and a chat application, you can quickly and easily talk to any part of the quote to cash cycle, whether it's creating an order, creating an agreement, or creating a quote. So a small group of us have been working on a demo for one of our CPQ customers, Lenovo. So I hope, Lenovo, you're watching. This demo's for you. So I'm going to play the role of a seller in Lenovo, and I want to quickly and easily create a quote and get that out to my customer. So I'm going to use the Skype application. I'm just going to go ahead and open this up. And all I have to do is talk to Max. And she'll walk me through the series of steps that are necessary to get this done. So I'm just going to ask her to uh, create a quote for my customer, Acme. All I have to do is start talking to her and telling her what I want to do. And uh, now, layering Max directly in on top of the CPQ process, you can see she's actually pulling out the product catalog here, showing me the products and services that I have the ability to quote. I'm going to go ahead and select laptops because that's what I want to sell. Now again, she's pull pulling in another category here. So I've got my ThinkPad products and services. So it's great. It's layered on top of CPQ. But everybody loves guided selling for those new reps, right? Let's take a look at what guided selling looks like inside of Max. Recommend a laptop for under $1,800 that's lightweight and has 8 gigabytes of memory. Sweet. Gone ahead and entered that in. Now, Max, using the guided selling rules within Aptis CPQ you've already set up, coming back and recommending a product. That sounds good. I definitely want to configure that machine. I like that product. And she's also alerting me that a promotion is running for this customer. Perfect. I mentioned that this was one of my largest customers, so I'll just go ahead and add 5,000 of those. Now, she is going to walk me through all the necessary, like mandatory configurations that I have to do. So I'll go ahead and select the default option. She's also just walking me through a couple of the configurable options for the solution, and I'll go ahead and enter in those. Now, here comes in some configuration rules and some recommendations. Yeah, I think I'm definitely OK with adding an additional product like this, so that's great. I'll go ahead and add that in. Now, Max is actually reaching out to Aptis CPQ and creating that quote in real time. She's just created that. Now she's going to go and create the configuration. She's going to create those line items. If there are any approval rules or any configuration rules, those are going to be fired. Now you can see those products that were added. You can see the list price associated with those products, and you can see their quantities, the extended price, and there's no discount. So far, all standard CPQ. What's happening now is that machine learning is coming into place. We're actually calculating what we know about this customer, similar customers, and their propensity to buy an additional product. In this case, warranty. Definitely want to add premium warranty for this many laptops to my configuration. So the quote's been updated. And of course, as a seller, I always have the ability to add anything else. So I'm just going to go ahead and add 
5,000 of these docks so that they can comfortably put this into their, uh, at their desks. Not that they're going to need to be at their desks if they've got Macs. So we've just added that to the quote. Now you can see the ThinkPad. You can see all the other solutions that are added in there as well. And like I said, as one of my best customers, let me go ahead and give them a 20% discount. All of your existing approval rules, configuration rules, machine learning is going to work directly inside here. So what this is saying is I don't really have the right for a 20% discount, but I definitely want to get this out. So I'm going to route this for approval directly to my manager. And as we can see here, she's notified the manager. Now, I don't really have time to wait for this to, to, for this to go through or for my, ma my manager, whatever he's doing. Let me just go ahead and call my manager, Dan, to see if we can't uh, get in, collaborate, and get this thing done real quickly. Hopefully he's available, not busy. Let's see. Hey, Dan, it's Nick. I really need your help getting this approval done, like right now. Nick, I'm kind of in the middle of something here. I'm, I'm actually watching your demo right now. OK, dude, you're part of the demo now. Like, let's go. I need this approval. Well, right now? OK, well, do me a favor. Set up a group conversation chat with Max, and let's get this done. OK, no worries. Great. Well, lucky, luckily for me, in this ad hoc request that I have to uh, go out and create this uh, approval for Nick, with Max, approvals really have never been easier. So I, of course, could go and have a conversation with Max in a very similar way that Nick just did to go out and create the quote. But what I also want to share with you is how you can use Max in a collaborative way so that Nick and I can have a conversation and add Max to that group and then go ahead and accomplish the outcome that we're looking to achieve, in this case, the discount. So I'm going to go back here. You can see that uh, Nick has created a group chat for us. And I don't necessarily know all of the details here, so I'm going to ask Nick to quickly provide the details. So I'm texting with Nick right now. Max is part of this as well. Um, and so what I'm really looking for is a heads up view of the display for the information that I need as an approver to go out and make the approval. So Nick actually has asked Max to provide a deal summary view for me, and you can see that Everything that I need as a prover is right here on my screen so that I can take a look at this and make the best decision. So I see that Nick has quoted the ThinkPad 2460s. Uh, and what, there's two things that really stand out to me as an approver is, is that Max is telling me that this deal is actually a risky deal, which probably not the best deal for me as the, not only the approver, but also for the company. And I'm also looking at the margin. So margin right now is showing that it's at 27%. And you know, we really try to like to keep that, uh, that approval uh, above 30%. So as an approver, I can reject this, of course. I could put in my own discount amount, or I could approve it. But I also have something at my disposal which is pretty incredible. I can actually ask Max what she recommends. So let me go ahead and type that in quickly. I'll say. What do you recommend? And in doing so, Max is going to analyze a number of different parameters for me. She's going to look at this particular deal using machine learning too as well, perhaps look at other companies or other customers that are similar to this, perhaps even taking in information about you know, what time of date it is in the quarter, right? If it's at the end, perhaps that we're going to give a more dis aggressive discount. And I can see that Max has actually recommended a 15% discount essentially as the path, path of least resistance for me to get this deal done. I also notice that not only is it a preferred deal now, but it's also bumped up the margin for this particular deal to 32%. So this is something that I'm actually a little bit more pleased with. I have the option to approve, reject, or reassign this, but not wanting to get anybody else involved from the audience, let me go ahead and just approve it. So I click the approval button. And when doing so now, this quote is now approved. It's ready to be sent out to my customer if I wanted to take a look. She's updated the quote. And you know what? Let's take a look at the quote document that we've just have. So I'm going to ask Max to generate quote. And what we'll do is all the information that Nick has provided during the configuration experience is going to be merged into our proposal document. It's going to conditionally assemble that quote document with all of the information that's sort of the sales terms, the line items itself. And you can see that PDF document there is available for me to view. And I'll take a look at that in just one second. But Max is now also being predictive for me. She's asking if I want to send this off to the prospect. And as a matter of fact, Max, thanks for saving me that one last step. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'll tell Max to please send that off to my prospect. 
So Max is going to go ahead and take that proposal document, send it off, and save me that extra step from actually having to send that out. So let's go back up and take a look at our quote document now. We'll open this quote document up. We'll see what was actually generated. And you can see we have a beautiful looking proposal document that was generated for us with the, the language for this particular deal. And we see our line items here of what we've quoted, which is the ThinkPad 2460s, the Microsoft Office Professional, and those Ultra Docs that Nick has also uh, added on to the quote. And so, you know, I think that is actually extremely remarkable because what we did is we simply had a conversation, right? Not only did we go out and generate a quote by simply having that conversation in a manner that's very similar as if Nick and I had our own assistants, right? So we had this little quick back and forth. We also uh, benefited from these machine learning recommendations that really increase the deal size. And then we were also able to bring Max into a collaboration so Nick and I could both talk together to figure out what the right deal is and then take action leveraging Max in that very same conversation. So really incredible stuff. And as we continue down, wait, Nick, are, are you ready now? Why don't, you, why don't you come out here? Nick McCoy, everybody, let's get him out here. Dude. Thank you so much for the help, man. Hey, anytime you get that quote up. Awesome, appreciate Thanks. it. Dan Hopkins, ladies and gentlemen. Woo. I'm really glad that Dan was here to help me out and get this quote approved. Obviously, quote to cash, CPQ, contract lifecycle management, doesn't work unless you're all collaborating together. So we were taking this around, we were showing it to all of our customers, and yes, you know, they're very interested in seeing us being able to walk a sales rep through all the necessary steps that it takes to get a deal done. But what we heard time and time again was, what if I know exactly what I want to sell to that individual customer? So let's just take a look at one more example where we combined that exact same scenario for a different customer into one sentence. Guys, go ahead and pull up the phone here. We'll start another conversation with Max, and I'm just going to go ahead and kick this off. Now in this example, I'm going to put everything that we just saw into one sentence. I'm creating a quote of a certain quantity of a certain product with those options and another product for a certain account and a specific discount. We use natural language processing to parse all that out, detect the conversational intent of that individual and what they're trying to do. Right away, she knows that I want to create a quote. So she's created quote 898. Now she's going to go out, create that configuration, check to make sure that I haven't broken any rules. Now she's showing me all those products. I see all the products that are associated to that, and again, upsell, cross-sell consistently with her. She's dogged, but no, I'm not interested in adding any additional products here. Um, the only thing that I want to do is please send this quote. I don't even need to actually see this generated document. If I ask her to send this, she can go ahead, send it, send it out to the customer. But this is where CPQ and CLM intersect. This is where business process rules are being adhered to. I'm not saying that any of the sales guys in the room actually send the quotes out to the customer without an NDA when that's required, but if it is, we've got Max here to help us out. So yes, I want to go ahead and send that. No problem there. She'll go ahead and send that out. Now, of course, there may be a couple of things here that uh, Max is going to walk me through. You know, maybe she's going to trigger something else. Um, okay, well, obviously, we're going to need the start date, and then I'm just going to say, you know, no no special clauses uh, on this one. Now, of course, she can trigger me if there are any required fields or any necessary information. It looks like I've got their, uh, see, I'm incorporation Wong. No one's incorporated in California if they're smart. Go ahead and pull in Delaware there. Now, she's automatically updating that record. And yes, Max, send it. Yeah, we got to remove that step. Go ahead and send that out. But I wanted to send a quote. That was the goal of all of this, right? So now, once that customer signs that NDA, I can actually just have Max automatically send that quote out for them. So she's all good. Everything's taken care of. You know, thanks, Max. It's kind of weird. Once you get talking to her, I start thanking her and stuff like that. It's totally unnecessary to do. Let's pop in here, take a look. This is the email inbox of the customer. OK, so I've got the customer's email inbox here. Max has just sent that customer an email. It's actually sent them an e-signature envelope with one of our premier, uh, preferred e-signature e providers. You can see that's coming directly from Nick McCoy at Lenovo. Go ahead and open that document up. As the customer, I can sign this document that, uh, that Nick at Lenovo just sent to me. You can see that Delaware is in there. Automatically updated that quote. I'll go ahead and click down here. Maybe I want to update my signature. My hands aren't shaky at all. Go ahead and sign this document and get that signed. So now, in one sentence, I was able to completely configure that quote. 
In just another, I was able to send that NDA out for signature. You can see the fully signed NDA has come back, so now I've got the record of that. That's going to go out to Diego as well. And in just a moment, we're actually going to get that proposal signed as well. So now she's triggered off that proposal right away. I can go ahead and click in here, sign this proposal, and I'm going to walk through the whole process here. But just so that you know that this was actually that quote that we just configured, you're going to see those products and services different than what we, than what we just uh, showed in the previous example with Dan. Very cool, very cool. Great, thanks guys, appreciate that. It's pretty easy. All you have to do is talk. It's that simple, right? Now, yes, you can obviously interact with all these applications from the browser and through the standard quote to cash, you know, through whatever CRM you may, you may be using. But Max is UI agnostic. And what that means is we can plug the exact same bot into email. We can plug that into text. We can plug it into any of the chat applications that you see here, like Slack, Facebook Messenger, even I don't know if you're, any of you are familiar with 1-800-Flowers bot, they're doing a very similar thing to us, but nobody is doing this in the enterprise space. Of course, I just showed Skype, and that's how we're leveraging at Aptis. We allow our own salespeople to update opportunity information, CRM information directly from, uh, their, from their mobile devices anywhere they are. It's that simple. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that demo. I hope that gives you an idea of what Max can do. It's my pleasure to be here at Aptis Accelerate. Right now, I want to introduce the Chief Revenue Officer, the fearless leader of sales and marketing, Kamal Alawalia. Kamal? Awesome, man. Congrats. Congrats. Hey, so what if I have CRM adoption issues? Can I use Max just for CRM? CRM adoption issues? Uh, I've never heard of that. Really? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Max can be leveraged on top of any CRM, any CRM process, including any process within uh, the quote to cash process, obviously, like we just showed. Okay, so can you show it? You guys are incorrigible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hey, guys, pull the phone up one more time. Let's just take a quick look of how we would update um, our, uh, our CRM. All right, great. So uh, we're looking at my, oh, that's my bad. Eric, that's not you, man. That's all me. The guys in the back are freaking out right now because I messed them up. All right, so now we're looking at my phone, right? So we're back looking into Skype. Now let's just really quickly, we'll kick this off to Max once again. This one's super short, right? All I want to do is take a note. Now instead of updating anything in the quote to cash like the quote, we're just going to pull back some opportunity information. She knows I'm working with Venture. She's pulled back the four opportunities that I have with Venture because I didn't, uh, or excuse me, the three, because I didn't specify which one I wanted. Can update any of those opportunities. Now she's listening. Lenovo closed this opportunity because we came in at the right price, we had the right products, and we were able to meet their tight timeline. Beautiful. All I have to do, send that out. It's all set. We're updated. Now all I have to do is put a little name in here. I'll just put this in as one opportunity notes. Got it. She's wishing me a good time at club. Kamal, Kirk, you guys hear that? Let's really quick just... Let's really quick just take a look at the machine, guys, and uh, we'll take a look at what that uh, opportunity looks like. There it is, enterprise refresh opportunity. So we're, now we're inside Salesforce. This is the opportunity that we just updated. You'll notice 207. God, we're really behind schedule. Go ahead, click in here on the one opportunity notes. You can see Lenovo closed this opportunity because we came in at the right price. We had the right products. We were able to meet their tight deadline. It's that easy. That easy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us. It's been a very busy year for us and for you all. And yesterday was really good. We had both our customer advisory board meeting and an executive summit. And there were a couple of interesting things that started to come out. Last year, we started to focus from just delivering applications to focusing on outcomes. And it took us a while before we could start having the right conversations with our customers. And getting the right people in, the right focus, and elevating it not from a discussion of the 70-second feature, and we have those, but more to what the C-suite wants to solve and how to work backwards from there. So yesterday also we actually talked to our customers and what are the, some of the key themes that are coming up when we talk about transformation, because everybody talks about transformation, right? So the four things that have come up is 
92% of our customers want the ability for their customers to self-serve. And this morning, Andy Hoare also, if some of you actually got a chance to listen to him, he does a fantastic job of laying out that full spectrum of selling from self-service to full service. And if you put e-commerce with CPQ and CRM, you can actually cover all of it. And then the support for modern business models. 84% of you all either have a subscription business or need to move to a subscription business model. And that's actually driving a lot of the transformation projects that we are in. The need for solution selling. All of you have massive product catalogs. How do you leverage all of it at the point of sale? Just like uh, Kirk was saying, the presentment of price. How do you bring it all together? Products and services, training, everything. And last but not least is managing by exception. We're very good at automation, but with large organizations, you can't get let go of the guardrails. So how do you actually pick up speed without giving up on the risk mitigation stuff? All these four things are starting to resonate more and more. So let's talk about some of the outcomes that we have d delivered to our customers. They really fall into three buckets. Number one is really the top line, sales effectiveness, both in terms of sales efficiency and the ability to increase the deal size, win rates, reducing discounting and all of that stuff. Some of our customers have had single digit or double digit increase in their top line, and that's substantial. Other bucket is on the compliance side, definitely the area for a CFO or a GC to, again, allow the business to run faster without giving up on the, the guardrails that you need to operate within. And especially these days with ASC 606, how many of you are actually having to look at ASC 606 and revisit your revenue recognition? Exactly. Your revenue recognition no longer is based on your invoices, it's based on your contracted price. So if you don't have your arms around that, especially in a subscription environment, you're just asking for trouble, it's around the corner. And then the third thing that came up from a lot of our customers even yesterday uh, when Craig from Thomas Reuters told us about his journey is about how do you become easier to do business with. And in a subscription business, the key here is the renewal is actually a very important thing. If you're not paying attention and delivering value, customer can walk away. So all of the groundwork that you do leads up to the higher SAT, which leads to the renewal rates. So along with this massive investment last year in our Partner First program, because the growth curve that we were on, and today from what we hear from the analysts, based on the growth curve, we are in the top 10 software companies in the world, soft SaaS companies in the world. We needed to invest heavily in our partners not just in terms of enablement so that they could cover entire code to cash application and transformations, but also in their success. We have also invested heavily in a team of experts that actually works with our partners so that any engagement you have with our partner, you have Aptus expertise available. And this kind of investment is staying off, paying off bigly for us. And yes, that is a word, and this morning it was added to Oxford Dictionary. And yes, that is fake news. <laughs> but the key thing about the changes that Kirk talked about with the Aptus Intelligent Cloud is that it has opened up markets for us that we were not playing in earlier. IBM, you hopefully got to hear from them this morning. Microsoft, a lot of innovation working not only with their platform Azure, but also with their core technology around machine learning as well as Cortana that's powering uh, our own Macs. All of those are available. You heard from ServiceNow and how we're starting to work with them for their customers. And uh, tomorrow you'll also hear from Workday who want our front office sitting on their financials. So along with the partnerships with our system integration partners, the platforms that we are now able to cater to and the ecosystems is just fantastic. And last but not the least, please put your hands together and thank all of our sponsors who made this event possible. Had we known it was going to be so warm, we probably would have asked one of them to sponsor fans or air conditioning over here, or just break down the thing. How many of you have Kirk's book in your, with you? All right, so those of you who don't have the pleasure of having it on your nightstand, go ahead and order it. While he wrote the book, 
we all feel like we've all been on the journey with him. What we would love to do is start hearing from all of you. You all have your Code to Cash stories, so do send them over and share your stories with a community that's now actually 7,000 strong. So would love to actually have you part of this thing so that we can start to expand the best practices and really start to share that. Other major investment, we have a fairly broad suite of uh, solutions, but we're now starting to work with our partners, not just in terms of delivering those solutions, but also collaboration on the innovation side. And you've seen these hexagons all over the place, multiple verticals that we are very, playing very strongly in. High tech, you've already seen HP, you'll soon uh, hear from Lenovo, you heard IBM earlier. Uh, eight of the top 10 software companies actually run on Aptus. Right, think about it. Except for direct competitor Oracle, every single other company, eight of the top 10, are actually running on uh, Aptus. Some of the biggest SaaS ventures, Salesforce, Workday, and more, all running on Aptus. We've been investing heavily on the oil and energy sector, oil and gas and energy, and Accenture has been a partner in actually building a vertical solution for oil and field services. They're also actually talking about the inquiry to order solution that we have built together for manufacturing. And I think in their session, they will have ABB talk about that as well, about how essentially tight collaboration has built a complete end-to-end -end solution. Hitachi has been partnering with us on financial services. And on the healthcare life sciences side, not only are we delivering outcomes where the time from contracting to closure is within 24 hours for a company like Avenir, but Deloitte has been working with us to build similar blueprints for med device uh, organizations. And we're about to finish our GSA certification. So sometime this summer, we will be able to start selling our contract management solution to state, local, federal, and educational institutions. So this has really laid a very strong foundation, and that's what drove the need to really have a platform that we could own and innovate at the pace that we wanted to innovate with. So tomorrow morning, you will get a lot more detail on the re-architecture and redesign that our brilliant product team has done. But I'll share with you some of the early outcomes that all we already have. 25x improvement in the cart line volumes that we can support. How many of you have large catalogs? Not an issue anymore. Right, bring that over, hold the applause, I'll tell you and clap. 80% improvement, acceleration of firing off configuration rules. Now you can clap. <laughs> <laughs> we had to break the mold and actually embrace Angular JS Brave framework that allowed us to do more of the client side computing. And that has really sped this thing up along with innovation for cart grid. So not only can you get broad and deep in your uh, a coating and card process, but you can also now have a fantastic user experience. What's even more astounding is, using our microservices architecture, we can now do the pricing calculations 90% faster than we were doing it in the past. You can clap again for that for our product team. Because <laughs> when you talk about UX, it's easy to do the, it's not easy, but still, the conversational UI is fantastic, but the core needs to be as fast as a conversation, and that's the whole intent, and it's finally the thing is, us together, we can move at the pace that we want to. We're not beholden to other people's platforms. So, with that, how many of you actually use a Lenovo laptop? All right. <laughs> so, please join me in welcoming Scott Ottman, VP of Sales and Inside Sales at Lenovo. Yes, Mike is right there. Okay, get the mic on. There we okay, go. Okay, good afternoon. A little warm, isn't it? It is, it My is. My goodness, so I'm not gonna stay long. I won't keep you long. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Lenovo. We're a uh, 50, $46 billion company with 55,000 employees and we do business in 160 countries. Um, we ship, you know, roughly 16 million things a quarter. So a quarter? A quarter. So we're planning on doing lots of quotes. That's our goal. 
and we'll, we'll see if we can break the system. That would be our goal, <laughs> right? Uh, but what I would, would like to do first is, is I got the opportunity to come and present to you guys, and I want to talk about a couple more things. But I have a team back in Raleigh. I'm the executive sponsor, so I'm the one that has sponsored the CPQ deployment in Lenovo. But I have a team back in Raleigh along with the team from Aptis, and we actually drop a significant piece of code in roughly two weeks. Uh, and we'll talk about that deployment in a minute. But I want to thank them, because clearly they couldn't come because they're doing... <laughs> they're doing the heavy lifting. And, you know, I think they're watching the, the live stream, so I want them to know that, guys, it's hot. I'm really hot. <laughs> The weather's terrible. I couldn't get upgraded. I had to fly coach. Um, I was on like the second floor of the hotel and they didn't have a king. I had to do a double bed. So I'm doing my part. <laughs> I know you're doing your part, but I do appreciate uh, the hard work because like I said, we are going live. And let's talk about what live is. Live for us has been, believe it or not, a rapid deployment. It's been a four month deployment. So think about that. Four months from when we decided, wrote our first story, and when we will go live is, is, is a four-month journey. Uh, so that's something you need to think about. Uh, let me also talk about transformation. Transformation inside an organization, a large organization like ours, especially a global organization, is extremely hard. And so my recommendation is, is you take this thing in bite-sized chunks uh, a partner like Aptis is important because you have to have the vision, but take it in bite-sized chunks and then accelerate it. So we have a little motto on the team that talks about think big, start small, and scale fast. That's kind of the motto. And, uh, you know, the team thinks of this as an, you know, an evolution, not a revolution. That's the way you got to think about this. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about was I guess I came out about a month ago and spent some time with Kamal and Kirk. And uh, uh, we sat down and, and frankly, they gave me a demo of Max. Uh, they wanted me to talk about Max. I, I don't know what else to say after the demo, to be honest. Uh, that is one of the most exciting things that I've seen in some time. I have been trying to find something like that out in the marketplace uh, and, and I will tell you, when you hear what Andy talked about this morning, you hear about where this marketplace is going, and clearly I think Max is, is going to help tremendously, at least Lenovo, because think about it. I no longer have to have my inside sellers doing those mundane tasks that you just saw, right? I can have Max do it. So it's, I think we're excited about it. And what's funny is, is I came out a month ago and said, hey, I want to try this thing. The team got right on it. Not only did they do this demo, they obviously had to put the use cases together. And frankly, we're about to go pilot this thing at Lenovo, and we couldn't be more and more, more excited about uh, what Max can do. And the only CR or change request that I had was I asked if they could put my picture instead of the, 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 the avatar. And, and they said yes, so I don't know. Now, I think the only trade-off is if it drives adoption or it inhibits adoption. Well, no, they won't leave the picture they got. I don't think it'll drive adoption. So guys, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll just leave you before I get off, because I know it's hot, is many of you are here sitting here thinking about making a choice. What, what I will tell you is I was in your seat. And I think one of the things you got to think about is, is, is you have a solution and you have somebody providing the solution. The solution's a very small piece. The partnership is what matters. So I would tell you to think hard about, you know, those two things combined because that will make success. I, I think uh, HP said it best as well. There's three people in a room. When you're deploying something, there's three people in a room. You want those three people in the boat with you. And what I can tell you is for the four months or so that I've been working, and like I said, a rapid deployment in four months, this team 
has absolutely been in the boat. So uh, I, I can't thank them enough. So thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Every year, this keynote gets easier and easier. Customers like that, we need, the less we talk, the better it is. So one more interesting story. Please join me in welcoming Jack Borlin from Walters Kluwer. Welcome. Thank you. So tell our friends here a little bit about Walters Kluwer. What do you guys do? So, some of you may know us because you're in the legal space, but for those of you who don't, we provide expert content and solutions for people in the legal and compliance space. So we're a global company, 4.3 billion in revenue. We've been around for about 180 years, um, 19,000 employees, and we're primarily a subscription business. Excellent. So you already have some of our products in there, CPQ. Yes. Since we're talking about outcomes, what are the outcomes that you have realized so far? Absolutely, so we implemented the CPQ in 2015, and the reason that we were implementing it, we were looking for a solution that could take our complex pricing rules, embed them into a quote process that would uh, allow our reps to get the right price to the customer with the right approvals, with the right terms and conditions. And being a subscription business, you had to get the right terms and conditions. Aptus allowed us to provide that to our customers and it actually took a problem that we had with compliance with auto renewal terms and drove 99% compliance with those terms. In addition, we flipped from about a 40-60 uh, uh, opt-in versus opt-out for auto renewal to a 60-40 ratio on our subscriptions. And as an unexpected side benefit, we reduced the, uh, the uh, returns on speculative purchases by about 25% because we went with a 100% e-signature application where Aptus CPQ plus the Aptus X author for Word and an e-signature process meant that every order that went out, we got a signature back. Fantastic. Yeah. So last year at the event, you saw what you were doing with machine learning. Yes. And you were really interested in actually taking that back to your organization. Absolutely. I, I saw it last year at Accelerate, and I sat down with the team right there and said, we need this. This is going to give us top line growth. And uh, we have an enormous amount of contract data because we're a subscription business. We got an enormous amount of data about our customer demographics. We wanted a way to have predictive analytics that told us what's the appropriate product to uh, suggest to a sales rep to suggest to the customer, and also have that machine learning where it got better at the recommendations as time went on. And we were able to launch that last month. We actually won an innovation award within Walters Kluwer for our implementation, and the sales reps have been very thrilled with the, the delivery because it cuts down on their time, means that a new rep can get up to speed very quickly, means an existing rep doesn't have to spend time trying to figure out what's the most appropriate product to sell. Um, it's, it's just a, a game changer for us. So this, yeah. So what do you think of Max? Uh, we were already thinking about how can we you know, drive friction out of our processes. We were looking around for ways to find applications that would let us automate things like order creation, opportunity and quote creation, and Max is a dream come true. It's exactly what we were looking for. So we're very excited to take that next step with you. We just have to scope that out. Exactly, and next year come back and show us what you've done with Max. Absolutely. All right, great, thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. How is everyone? My name is Chris Weber. I'm responsible for our commercial customer segment at Microsoft, which essentially means we look at every customer from the small business down the road to our largest global accounts and everything in between. One of the best parts of my job is actually getting to talk to customers and partners and learning about the innovative things they're doing in their business to digitally transform their business. 
And so what I want to do today is share some of those examples and I think inspire you with what some of the work our customers and partners are doing. Before I do that, is it a little bit hot in here? Would I get some bonus points if everybody just stood up for 10 or 15 seconds, just get some air? I was sitting there earlier and it was very painful, but when I got to stand up, it was a little bit more, so we'll just let everyone stand up. Now, now being from Seattle, we just had the rainiest winter, I think, in our history, so I will take this heat any day uh, versus that. So I want to talk about what customers are doing with our technology to transform their business. I talked about, first thing I want to do is thank Aptis, uh, really for being here and the partnership that we have, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Because it's great to be here, not only because of the strategic relationship we have with Aptis, but when I looked at the list of customers that are doing business with Aptis, most of you are customers with Microsoft, so it's great to, great to have you here. In terms of the Aptis partnership, I was telling some customers earlier in some of our meetings, this isn't a partnership where we just put our logos on a piece of paper and say, hey, we're working together. This is actually a really deep partnership from everything we're doing on the engineering side. And how did you like that digital agent that they showed up there in terms of the quoting process? That was fantastic. Yeah. In fact, I told Kirk, even though I don't work for Aptis, I want to be able to demo that in front of every customer I see because basically that's using all our cognitive services and our Azure uh, cloud service to put that together. And I think it's the best implementation that I've seen in terms of really focusing on customer value. The second thing is we have a really strong sales and marketing uh, partnership with Aptis. But the thing that I think sets them apart than many of the partners we deal with is their maniacal focus on the user experience. I talked to Kirk about two weeks ago when we were getting ready for this, and I said to him, you know, you had a lot of cloud providers so you could pick to build your, your products on. Why did you pick Microsoft? And he basically said, look, in the cloud world, a lot of them could do the basic compute, the infrastructure, those type things. But the reason he picked Microsoft was he wanted to be able to do things that would create new and differentiating experiences for the user. So the cognitive services, the artificial intelligence, the things you see in that agent really is a manifestation of some of the services that we provide in our, our cloud products. And it's a great example, I think, of Aptis really focusing on the end user experience and bringing that to life. The other thing in terms of the partnership is we're betting on Aptis internally. So we just stood up and rolled out the contract management uh, part of the Aptis suite. This is coming from our legal team and everything I've heard. Uh, we're live, going well, and the implementation has been quite good. So the partnership's deep on the technical side, we're actually implementing their products, and then from a sales and marketing side, we're really excited about the solutions they've built on top of our, our products and technologies. Before I talk about some of the examples that our customers are doing around our technology, I thought I'd just talk about this world of the cloud, because I think we don't give that enough time in terms of some of the dynamics that are happening in the industry today. In these statements I'll talk about, it's whether it's the Microsoft Cloud or whether our competitors. What I would say for customers, it's a great time for customers to be in the cloud. And what I mean by that is there's three real big shifts that are happening. The first one is risk. And what I think happens in this cloud world is the risk dramatically shifts from customer to supplier. Supplier being Aptis, supplier being Microsoft, et cetera. If you think about historical IT purchases, normally what happened is vendors like ourselves and others would sell you on an amazing vision. And before you got to experience one iota of value in that vision, you had to acquire data center hardware, buy the software and applications, and probably sign some type of systems integration contract to get it deployed. That was all before you got any value whether what that was whether the vision was realized or not. In the cloud world, that dramatically changes. Because by the way, in that old model, the risk falls mostly on the customer. In this cloud world, it dramatically shifts. So you don't have to invest in the hardware, the compute cycles. You don't buy the software all up front. You do it from a consumption basis, when I'll talk about in a minute. We're spending billions of dollars a year at Microsoft building out these data centers worldwide 
to bring super low cost compute cycles for our customers. So it dramatically changes the risk profile from customer to vendor and supplier. And at minimum, I think the risk is in balance. The second thing is this cloud world really shifts from being a heavy CapEx environment to more of an OpEx. And I think we'll go through some growing pains there in terms of the way budgets are structured. But long term, I think having this OpEx versus CapEx is actually advantageous for our customers. And then the last one is this concept around consumption economics. And the key with this cloud world is you're only paying where you're seeing value. Again, where you see value, you'll continue to pay, almost in microtransactions versus everything up front. And where you don't see value, and if you get failure, you stop paying for that. And so I think, again, it brings great balance between supplier and customer. And at the end of the day, it makes suppliers like Microsoft and others earn your business every day. And so I think those dynamics and fundamentals on the cloud are really advantageous at this point for customers. So it's a great time to be in the cloud. This digital transformation theme, I'm sure every supplier and customer or vendor talks to you about it. It's probably an overused word. I want to just sort of give you our, our um, implementation of it and the conversations we're having with customers. On the left-hand side, there's really three big areas that Microsoft is investing all our R&D. The first one is around this ambition called Create More Personal Computing. And this is really around hardware and software around Windows and creating magical experiences. I don't know if you saw yesterday, we announced the Surface laptop, our first laptop. We're not in this for hardware sake alone. We want to look and see where we can take Windows, we can take premium hardware and software like Office and other things and bring it together in new categories of hardware that create these magical experiences. And what I would say is Microsoft's ambition is quite big in this, uh, this arena. The second one is around reinventing business productivity and processes productivity and business processes. This is really around the Office 365 set of products. What we see is a huge opportunity not only to make employees more productive with a collaboration suite, but how do we think around things with data and analytics? When you talk about artificial intelligence, it's really taking that data and reasoning it and, and building on top of that. How do we think about PBX in the cloud around voice and video collaboration? How do we think about taking our Office 365 set of products and integrating those core, core collaboration products into our CRM suite? And so we think there's huge opportunity there to create a more integrated experience for our customers. So we're investing big there. And then the third one is this intelligent cloud around Azure. And if you think about Azure, it's our cloud platform that provides a lot of services from infrastructure as a service, our basic compute, platform as a service where you can build your applications, and then software as a service where you take applications such as Aptus, run it in the cloud, and then extend it with services like you saw that they did with our cognitive services and other products. On the digital transformation, I'd like to tell you, hey, we have four conversations with customers, but the reality is co our customers have four conversations with us. And they're grounded in these. One, every customer we talk to, they want to engage and engage with their uh, customers in a new and different way. And so they're asking for help in terms of how they do that. So that's an outcome that we talk to our customers about. The second one is, how can customers create new and innovative products and bring those to market? I think that's top of mind for every customer. The third one is really around uh, empowering employees and making them more productive. But the second piece around that that's really not on there that we see a huge trend is companies need to create a modern day collaboration and productivity suite to attract and retain the workforce of the future. Because quite honestly, these workforce of the future, the millennials, et cetera, coming into corporate accounts, they're experiencing a worse environment in the company than they have in their personal life for the first time. And so companies are really looking at this as how do we create differentiation, not only making it more productive, but attracting and retaining employees. And then the fourth one is basically around how do we take out costs, operational efficiency. There's not a company on the planet that we don't talk about that want to take costs out of their business. So these four outcomes are what we're focused on with customers, and we'll give you some examples of customers using our technology to achieve these outcomes. 
Real quickly on Azure, I don't want to go through this in depth, but this is our cloud platform. I think there's four big differentiators that we have here. The first one is the platform is built on trust, and I put trust around security, availability, privacy, and transparency. At the end of the day, if we haven't earned that, that's the foundation really to do business with a customer. We're working very hard in this area, and we think this is an area of differentiation in terms of how we're applying it to the technology. The second one is app innovation, and I think Kirk's example of this digital agent with Max is a perfect example of it. It's why Kirk is betting on the Microsoft platform, because he wants to do new and differentiated experiences that he can differentiate his solutions and applications to you as customers and users. The third one is hybrid. The model that we have today says not everything will be in the cloud, but we have to give you a common model application layer, security layer, management layer that's common from public cloud to on-prem. You shouldn't have to have two different models. We are differentiated in this area. And then the fourth one is data-driven intelligence. When you think about all the data, whether it's from IoT or the applications that are coming in, the richness of what people can do, putting artificial intelligence, machine learning on top of it, it's amazing, and this is a huge opportunity, I think, for customers, and we're investing significantly in it. So now let me talk about a couple of customers in terms of how they're using this technology to reinvent their business on their journey in digital transformation. The first one is call, a company called Headwaters. First of all, is anybody familiar with this robot called Pepper from SoftBank? So it's out of Japan. Pepper is an amazing robot here, but this company called Headwaters, so what Pepper is, it's a robot that SoftBank built, but the back end is all powered by Azure, our cloud services. What Headwater is doing is building a set of services into Pepper using Azure to create new experiences for customers. And the example, and this is what, I, the reason I love this is it's a very small company. It's a ramen restaurant in Japan. And as you know, in Japan, ramen restaurants are a dime a dozen. But there's a restaurant in Japan who's taken Pepper the robot, our cognitive services on the back end, and when you come into the restaurant for the first time, Pepper will greet you and ask, can I take a picture of you? And if you do, they'll ask for some information. If you give them the information, every time you come into that restaurant, Pepper will greet you, because they use our facial recognition APIs. So it will greet you, but not only do that, it has your transaction history, and it'll say, based on your eating preferences, here's some new menu items or specials that we have today or this week to try. I love this example. By the way, there's a video on the web. I was going to show it. It's all in Japanese, so you probably wouldn't understand it. But it's very creative. And you start to think about all these cloud services. We think about the largest of enterprises. This is a small restaurant in Japan differentiating their customer experience using this robot and the cognitive services uh, in Azure. The second one, has anybody heard of Tyson Krupp? So there's a few elevator companies in the world. Tyson Krupp is one of them. So we work with Tyson Krupp on a couple different things, but the first thing is these elevators are complex. Lots of data in there, lots of sensors. But basically the challenge that they had is when an elevator breaks, it's too late. They have to get out there. It causes huge customer consternation and issues when it breaks. So basically what they did is outfitted their elevators with a set of sensors. Those sensors use our IoT services in Azure and takes all that data real-time into Azure. They apply machine learning on it, and basically are building a new predictive maintenance service to go to their customers. Because the goal on this is get to the elevator before the elevator breaks, not after it. And so they have that capability with both the Azure IoT services and then the business intelligence that they're building on top of it. The other cool thing that they're doing here, how many people have seen HoloLens? So quite a bit. HoloLens is our mixed reality product. Essentially, what I call it is it's a Windows 10 helmet on your head, uh, maybe a little prettier than a helmet, but basically you have a set of uh, glasses that you can see your physical world, but it mixes in the virtual world. And it's basically a Windows 10 PC. It's not tethered to anything, it's its own PC. But what Tyson Krupp has done, one of the challenges they have is when a mechanic goes out to work on the elevator, they don't have all the answers. And so they have to call back into corporate to understand or to relay the things that are happening. What they're using, I think you can see it here, is the mechanics now when they go out to the elevator are wearing HoloLens, 
when they're looking at the elevator and the, the different sensors that are on there, that's transmitted live back to HQ and someone has seen that, they're actually able to write on it for that person to see in their glasses what they're supposed to fix and how they're supposed to fix it. Also, when they're looking at the elevator, they can call up the user manual if they needed to understand things there, et cetera. So Tyson Krupp is doing some very interesting things in terms of creating a new business model around proactive maintenance. But the second thing is using HoloLens in a way to make their mechanics who are working on these elevators super efficient. We're seeing a lot of momentum in this with HoloLens in the commercial space. The third one is Uber. How many people came here from Uber today? See a few hands. The challenge that Uber had is when they hire a driver, they do a background, background check on the driver. Do a background check, they take photos, et cetera. So that works on date of hire, but they had to have a system, a secure system, that validated periodically the driver in the car is the driver who says they're in the car. So they came to us, proposed the problem, what we did is used our facial recognition APIs again. We're on the Uber app for employees. They periodically, when they log into that app, it asks to take a picture, and it will take that picture using the back-end cloud services, and it will check to verify that that driver is who they say they are to make sure the, the passengers are always in a safe environment. So it's an incredible way to, one, improve the security of what they're offering to their customers in a very uh, innovative way with the technology. We have a quick video, so we can just run that to show you what they're doing there. We come to work every day to pilot, test, and launch new technology solutions Real-time ID check is the latest technology example where we at Uber are constantly developing and testing new solutions to predict, prevent, and reduce security risks in ways that weren't possible before. It's through this partnership with Microsoft that we've been able to develop this technology quickly and ensure that every rider and every driver has an excellent experience. Real-time ID check is a prompt that appears in the driver's app asking them to take a self photo. We can do a check in real time to make sure that that identity of the person who took the picture matches the account holder who's been approved to drive. Doing that serves a couple of purposes. Drivers know that their identities and their accounts are being protected, and riders know that the driver who they're with has been screened. Jen? Evan? Uh, yeah. Real-time ID is a smart technology. What that means is it factors in and addresses the edge cases. The situation where the driver is wearing glasses or a hat and they weren't in the identification that we have on file. The beautiful thing is it can recognize these changes and ask the driver to remove their sunglasses or retake the photo. The partnership with Microsoft Cognitive Services allowed us to go from idea to execution to implementation across the country in a matter of months. Already we've been able to make thousands of rides safer and very soon we're going to be making millions of rides safer through this technology. We have thousands of examples where customers are using this in a way to do innovative things. I'll just give you another example. There's a trucking company that basically is trying to improve driver safety as they drive across the U.S. And what they've done is mounted cameras in their trucks. And it basically, through live video, it's looking at that driver. One, it's checking if they have a cell phone. So if you put your hand up to your ear, it would automatically set some alarms. If they notice the driver is dozing off, it sets off alarms. If they notice the driver is distracted, et cetera, all in the spirit of improving driver safety. The beauty is these cloud services are easy to get started and build these things, and they have dramatic effect on the business. One that we use internally is a virtual support agent. I told Kirk backstage, I'm sort of hesitant, I'm going to do a demo of this one, but based on his agent, which had, Max seems much more intelligent than this one in terms of the depth that Max has. But this just gives you a different uh, business situation in terms of how to apply this. But the challenge we had at Microsoft is we have 1.5 billion users of Windows across the globe. 
everything from Windows 7 to Windows XP. I'm sure we have some Windows Vista users out there, and obviously about a half a billion Windows 10 users. The challenge is, as you can imagine, with a billion and a half users, we have quite a high degree of support calls that come in, which obviously is very time consuming, very costly, and it prevents us from focusing our most productive resources on the hardest problems. So what we did is took the data that was coming in and basically reasoned it to figure out what are the top things that people are calling in for, and we built an agent similar to what you saw the Aptus folks do to address the core Windows problems. This one we've been running live for a few months now. I'll show you a demo of it, but just to give you an example, as you can imagine, 1.5 billion users, the number of calls we, we come in, it's tens of millions of dollars of cost we're seeing a significant reduction in the call volume around Windows uh, issues that are coming in because of this very simple uh, chatbot. The good news is, is as we build this agent, we've taken, I think, around the top 10 issues that come up, but this gets smarter every day. We'll take the next 10 and keep building on it and build more and more logic in here, where one, it's a delightful experience for the user, but it also allows us to take and reinvest our resources in those problems that are, are harder to solve. So I want to give you a quick demo of that. So basically, this is the support site off of, of Microsoft.com, support.microsoft.com. And basically, what I'll do is just say, I want to contact or hit contact us. And what you'll see here is the agent will come up and basically say, need assistance. And so we'll do a couple different scenarios here. So I'll say, get started. And the first one I'm going to just do is ask them, how would I get Windows 10? Because I'm sure everyone's going to run out of here and say, I want Windows 10. So as a sales guy, I'll assume that. So we'll say, how do I get Windows 10? And then what you'll see is just like you saw in the uh, virtual assistant that, that Aptis did, it'll come back and say, here's what I think you're asking, how to get Windows 10 creators update, is that correct? I'm going to say yes on that one. It'll take that as an input, and then it'll come back and give me a set of things that I can do in terms of where I can install it or where I can buy it. And what's interesting on here, you can see here where it says, here's the download website. If I went to that website, it basically would, in the same chatbot window, if I didn't own Windows 10, it would give me the ability to buy it right within there. So again, it doesn't go to a separate application. So now we're taking a support environment where it's trying to solve problems, but I said I'm trying to get Windows 10. It actually brings you in where you could transact the business, so not just constrained to uh, the support there. The second one that I'll do is we have this thing called Windows Update, so I'll say, Windows update won't work. It's probably not the best example for me to give because we think it always works. But we'll just pretend in case it doesn't, what happens. So it says, what version of Windows are you running in terms of what's not working? We'll say Windows 10. What you'll see is it'll come up with some diagnostics in terms of what to do. But in this case, it basically says, hey, we have a troubleshooter to help you with that. If I clicked on that link, Basically, what you'll see is it'll launch. It'll ask me if I want to download some software, which is the, the troubleshooter. I won't do that. But again, as you can see, the simple agent not only deciphers what I'm trying to ask, but then gives us solutions to, to solve it from a technology perspective. So I showed one where it actually would allow me to transact the software in the window. The second one is um, actually going out and download, uh, downloading the software. The third one is more of a common problem. And I'm just going to say my printer won't work. Now, I'm thinking, my printer won't print. I'm thinking we're not going to be able to answer all the questions if it just doesn't print. We're going to have to figure out, is this thing connected to a Windows machine? And so when I say my printer won't work, basically it says, here's what I think you're asking me, using a printer with Windows, say yes. Obviously, if we said no, we're probably not going to be the best printer support uh, hotline that's out there. And it'll come back and give you give me a number of things to do. Again, I could run a troubleshooter. If I clicked on that, it would allow me to download the code and walk me through that. Again, this is a very simple example where we've implemented this at Microsoft, but it's reducing our call volume significantly, and it's getting smarter and smarter as it goes, and allowing us to reinvest in those problems that are harder to solve. And it's also quite delightful experience. The reason I bring this up, you saw a very advanced one that Kirk did. This is a more simple one. Both of them have tremendous business value. 
and they're not that difficult to set up. As a sales guy, I don't want to say easy because that probably sounds totally salesy, but these things are very easy to set up, even if it's the top three issues that you have, and then add the next couple, but they have dramatic results to the business overall. So again, what I hoped I showed you today is a number of customers who are using our technologies, our cloud platform, to really reinvent their business around this digital transformation journey, and hopefully inspired you to go look at it and see how it can help you in your business. Our mission at Microsoft is to empower every individual in business around the planet to achieve more. So on behalf of the 100,000 plus Microsoft employees coming to work every day to make that vision real for our customers, thank you and have a great day. Thank you.